It's a great pleasure to be here. I have been coming back and back to Oxford um, for very, very, very many years. I live in Hereford, so I sort of go through the, through the station frequently. So it's, 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 it's lovely to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is to go through the programme. Uh, please feel free to interject as I go along. I think um, many people will have come with a question or with a a point that they would like or a comment that they'd like to make. Um, and I'm happy to take those as we go along because otherwise it will be just very tedious listening to me droning on and on and on. And it will be interesting for everybody else. We, we, we do need to get through the day, so sometimes we may have to park particular issues and deal with them in the break or in discussions with colleagues. But please don't feel... Um, <clears throat> hesitant, although Keira seldom feel hesitant at events like this, uh, um, about raising issues. What I wanted to do to start with was to talk about some resources. I, I tried to put quite a lot of resources on a website that I run because um, they are commonly occurring problems. And colleagues, as you probably know, legal aid lawyers and uh, the like are in very short supply. So increasingly we have to rely, and it's a good thing we have to rely on wonderful organisations like Oxford Carers uh, and also resources from other um, charities. So on my website, I just wanted to flag up some things before, before we sort of roll our sleeves up and look at the law. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time today looking at disabled children's um, rights um, or young carers. I'm happy to talk about that, uh, but we've had to sort of contain the, the program and, and those are not central. Um, but I will, where I can, flag up issues that are relevant. I write a book with Stephen Broach and Janet Reed called Disabled Children um, and the Law. And if you go to my website, I'll explain how that works. My website's this thing here, lukeclemens.com. You could just click on that and download it. It's free to download. The Council for Disabled Children <coughs> gave the pub publishers some money. Um, and uh, so you can just go. And it's got a chapter on transitions, which we will look at later today. Um, the rights of disabled children, special education rights, health rights, social care rights capacity and decision-making rights and things like that. Um, every year, ah, oh, this is interesting. It's going off the top, isn't it? Um, I write a book for Carers UK on um, that's good enough. Um, carers and their rights. So this is an edition this year. Uh, and again, if you go to the website, you can just download that. That's about a, this is about 600 pages long. That's about 120 pages long. But it, it has all the wicked detail and the footnotes. And I'll be explaining, sometimes it's good to use a little footnote <coughs> in a letter to a public body. And I write a, a really beastly book called Community Care and the Law, which isn't available to download. Um, but that's horrible. It's a 1,200 page thing that Nobody in the right mind uh, um, <laughs> buys. Um, but the, the, there would be lots of copies of that in libraries, university libraries. Every legal department should have uh, several copies of it. Um, the courts use it. So that if you need something, that's where the, the, the really horrible stuff is. If you go to my website, um, I've got sort of, a res sort of various tabs. And if you, on resources, this is the resources page. <clears throat> it's got stuff like challenging cost ceilings, challenging requirements to repay direct payments, challenging home care charges, challenging, challenging is the key word, reductions in care services, which are very common. We're going to have to cut your package. Challenging council panels, which are really naughty things we'll look at today. Uh, disabled children's rights guide, finding a lawyer, problem solving. So there's a lot of standard issues, transport to social services, transport to school, big issues, particularly in rural areas. Um, and if you then go to publications, then all the publications are generally there. So that, that one I've just mentioned, Care as Rights, if you just click on that, the book opens up. So hopefully that's, um, oh, what's this? Uh, what am I doing there? 
Oh yes, we've written a, a um, <clears throat> I run a, I'm really incredibly fortunate, I run a research center at Leeds University Law School, which is the largest disability law center in the world. Um, it's got just incredibly wonderful people there. Um, my chair is funded by a charity called Cerebra, which is a disabled children's charity, a really amazing charity. Um, uh, they are a research charity, but they, they don't just fund um, medical charities. They fund, well, they fund one law charity, w law, law school, which is myself. Um, and we, we, we're interested in how you solve problems. Uh, how do, and really today I think will be about how do you access your rights if you don't have a sister who's a barrister, basically? Um, how do you, if you're not one of those people with those networks and you're good at writing stroppy letters and, you know, mentioning at a Masonic meeting or something like that, how do you get things sorted? Um, so we've, we produced a problem-solving guide on this, which is, which is also, you can download, and it is, I think, it, I mean, it's been incredibly well received, uh, based on Alice in Wonderland, because many people do think that they're in the wrong side of the mirror, basically, in <coughs> Wonderland. So we've got lots of um, useful quotes. It's very often very useful if you're, uh, if you're in dispute to just mention a snippet of law. I was talking just now about footnotes. Sometimes it's useful to say, look, I think this is wrong, factually it's wrong, it's unfair, oh, and I think it's contrary to the law, and then you cite an ombudsman's case. Um, and that's all you do, you just show the public body, the instruments of torture, basically. You say, um, we could go this way, but I'd like to just resolve it this way. Um, so it's useful sometimes to just have a snippet of law. It's very often useful to quote the word maladministration as well, <coughs> um, because, because spell checkers can actually tell you how you spell it. Um, <laughs> and it means if I don't solve this, I'm going to go to the ombudsman. And, and most local authorities are not keen on the ombudsman. Um, getting involved. It, it's getting very difficult. The bit of research we're doing at the moment, and I'll be, I shouldn't, um, the research, although I'm gonna look at the Ombudsman a lot and I've got a lot of time for the Ombudsman, we are doing some research at the moment about really serious problems with the Ombudsman delay and their disinclination to get involved in cases. So speak to me in the break about, it, um, so we are doing a major analysis of the last 15 years of ombudsman's decisions and their reluctance to get involved. But when they do get involved, they can be very important power for good and local authorities are not keen on them getting involved. Um, so we'll talk later. They've cut, yeah, we're doing research on their cuts, yes. And of course, that's, they've had their funding, all of them have had their funding cut by about 70%. Um, uh, and then we've, we've categorised disputes into nine different, so there's interagency disputes where health sets not us and social services say it's not them, and you're in the middle. Uh, and then we say, well, this is a common problem and this is what you do. Uh, you could work out who's responsible, you could buy my 101,500 page book and work it out. Uh, you can move to Belgium, is the second option. <laughs> or the third is, which is the actual correct solution, is you just sue them both. Um, and you just say, I can't be bothered to think this one through. One of you's got to grasp the nettle. So and there's a, then there's a standard letter about what you do. You don't sue them, but you make a complaint. Um, the manager says no. The panel says no. We'll look at panels today. Um, <coughs> too difficult to think about. Those are often things like transition planning and things like that. Social workers got too many cases. They've got huge caseloads. They can't think about medium term things. They're dealing with crises. And so this is what you do. And we'll, we'll look at transitions today. Um, and there's lots of, um, that's precedent letters at the end. Um, so that's a useful resource. It's still a bit high that, isn't it? Anyway, let's hope it won't be a problem. So those are useful things to look at because increasingly there are not these sort of legal aid lawyers and, 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 and organizations, wonderful organizations like Kiros organizations, incredibly overwhelmed and busy. So we are going to, all of us have to 
try and acquire those sort of knowledge and skills. So I'm going to talk largely about the CARE Act today, uh, although I'm also going to be talking about a thing called the Children and Families Act, which was also in 2014. The CARE Act was designed to codify, to sort of put into one volume all the laws that had existed on adult social care since 1948. The Children and Families Act was largely designed to deal with reforming special education law, uh, but it was also used as a device to address the needs of uh, young carers and parent carers. So we're going to look at parent carers after lunch and we'll then look at what this act did. But the, the CARE Act is largely about adults. <coughs> um, the long title includes this phrase, this sentence, this clause or whatever it is, um, make provision to reform the law related to care for the support of adults. Uh, not children, not young carers. It only deals with adults. So if we look to the CARE Act, it's where you've got an adult person being cared for by another adult person. If you've got a disabled child being cared for by an adult, a mother, a father, then you're going to have to look to the Children and Families Act. If you've got, um, an ad, uh, you've got a young carer caring for an adult, and 70% of young carers do care for adults, um, again, you're going to have to look to the Children and Families Act. So what I'm going to be talking about mainly, mainly this morning, but I'm happy to explain the differences if, you, if you're, you've got a question, an issue about a, young, uh, a disabled person, a disabled child. Um, but the CARE Act is about adults caring for adults. In relation to adults, the CARE Act did really nothing. It just sort of took the old law and put it in a new act. It just rolled it over. Uh, it didn't take away any rights, but it didn't really add much. It just, you know, so if you were getting a direct payment before the uh, 1st of April 2015 when the act came into force, you carried on getting a direct payment under the new act. If you were being assessed under the old act, you were assessed under the new act. It was pretty much the same. But for carers, it was dramatic. Um, the law radically improved. <clears throat> and yet, it's had no impact at all. Uh, it would be fascinating if one of you could do a PhD on this issue. Uh, I'm going to come up with lots of full-time or part-time PhD suggestions. But why did it not have an impact? Uh, why don't we have a radical carers movement the way we had radical disabled people's movement, radical gay movement, radical <coughs> civil rights movement? Why don't we have a radical carers movement? Why are carers not taking these cases? <laughs> They're too exhausted. They're too... It's too conflicted. Um, I'm writing another paper. Um, I've written a big paper on the history of the carers movement called Does Your Carer Take Sugar? Which, of course, you can download from my website. But um, I've decided that it's more than that. But I'm not going to get around to finishing this article. It's called, called Carers as Dark Matter. Uh, uh, it's sort of, um, but I'd really like one of you to do a PhD on it, which will be finished before my article. Uh, 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 so it's an interesting issue. Why are carers not being more radical? Yes, I know they're exhausted. Yes, I know that they haven't got any time to be radical. But I think there's something more complex at heart than that. Okay, uh, I hope that the slides that now follow have some semblance to the ones that Jan was photocopying for you a couple of days ago, um, uh, which you should have. I have an awful habit of changing slides between sending them, uh, and so if there are some more, can you just shout at me? I'll put these up on my website, the slides will be up on the website, but uh, hopefully these will follow. Have you got something called the importance of evidence? I don't think you have. You have. That's great. Oh, this is starting well. Um, yeah, evidence is just crucial. Um, and so lawyers are interested in <coughs> evidence. Ombudsmen are interested in evidence. Judges are interested in evidence. And so are local authorities. Um, 
And it's, it, it, it's, it's just crucial that this, these sort of issues come down to evidence. One of the really important things about the new legislation is that it starts with the presumption that disabled people, carers, adults, know best. That their best place to judge what is their well-being. I'm going to spend quite a lot of time looking at well-being. Under the old law, um, it was really the social worker that decided in social care. Well, it's my decision, this is position, and I've done this because I've been a social worker for 30 years and I don't think you need that. And anyway, I don't think that's a need. Um, I think that's a want, a wish, an aspiration, a choice. It's not a need. I tell you what a need is. Both those things have changed. Under the new law, the legislation says what needs are, not social workers, not local authority councils. And the presumption is that the disabled person, the carer, knows best. So if a local authority wishes to say, well, that is not needed, they're going to have to produce the evidence if the disabled person or the carer said, I need it. Do you see, the, the, the onus is that you need it unless some evidence can be produced to show that you don't. Big change, actually, and that's a lot of the Ombudsman's cases resolve around that. Well, the presumption is they need it. Where's your evidence to say they don't? And I'll come back to this. If you have an identified need in the assessment, then the care plan must meet the need. And the care plan mustn't just say, well, this is what, how we're going to meet the need. It's going to have to explain in detail. It's got to give evidence about how that need, how that, that support, that service, that respite care, that aftercare, that person calling in during the day will actually be enough to meet the need. It's not good enough just to say it's obvious. It's got to have detail. And we'll look at some cases on that. Every year, the local authority, sh if you're getting support, and this is for adults and children, and all of these points are for adults and children, um, should review your care plan. Now, most people dread a review these days because it's often a pretext for cutting a budget. We've got shortage of money, we've got to cut your budget, you cut your care services. Now, that's illegal. The, uh, the law is you must meet need, regardless of cost. You, if you've got two ways of meeting the need, then you can choose the cheaper, but you must always meet need. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, we haven't got any money, so we've got to not meet your need anymore. You've got to meet need. But if there's two ways of meeting that need, the local authority can choose the cheaper. So I'm caring for somebody, and we've got a package, we've got a direct payments package, it's fine, everything's great. The social worker comes along and reviews it and says, um, I'm going to have to do a reassessment because I think we're going to have to cut your support. And you say, well, you can only reassess me if the review shows that my need isn't being met. So what is it that you have, what's the evidence you've got that says you need to reassess me? Because the review says everything's okay. So what is the evidence you've got to convert this review, which should be quite sort of superficial, not superficial, but quite light touch, into a full-blown reassessment? The only reason you want to reassess me is you want to cut my support, because I'm telling you everything's fine. So the ombudsman is saying, well, where's the evidence that converted that sort of benign review into a malign <coughs> reassessment? And one of the big things we've got to look at today is if the disabled person is reassessed and if they say we are going to cut your support and if that means the carer has got to take on new responsibilities because the local authority won't do it then you've got to have it in writing from the carer that they're really happy to do that Ooh, you know because carers don't adult carers don't have to provide care they haven't had to provide care for their husbands or Anybody. There's no law in this country to, that you've got to provide care. That went on the 5th of July 1948. <coughs> so we're going to cut the support for the person for whom you care. Um, that by 10 hours a week. Um, are you happy about that? Because of course you're going to have to do another 10 hours caring. <coughs> I'm absolutely delighted. Signed. <laughs> kisses um, on a statement. You've got to have it in writing, uh, which is a very, very key issue because 
with these cutbacks that are happening, of course, most disabled people are getting support. It's just that not being provided by the NHS, that's not being provided by social services, it's, being, it's carers that have taken the strain. And carers are the elastic that's kept this crazy neoliberal financial system from breaking down. And carers are stretched now, I think, to the point you can't really stretch them much more. But they've taken the strain of these companies. That says statutory guidance. <clears throat> the Act is, is a typical Act. Don't read it um, unless you have a large alcoholic bottle in front of you that's open. <laughs> it's not good for your health. I mean, nothing like as good for your health as gin. Um, it, it, so, so it's not a terribly accessible Act. I will be quoting from it, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not an easy read. But with it goes a thing called the statutory guidance, and you just Google Statutory Guidance Care Act and you get it. Um, and it is very readable and it's searchable. You can search for respite or, I don't know, short break or reduction or panel. Um, and uh, you, you get there. And it's 500 odd pages, but it's very good. Um, it's it's, it's um, regularly updated, which is a bit irritating but largely just to deal with typos and just sort of grammatical issues. It has just been updated by June, July. Um, and it's really got the force of law. So if you can find something in the statutory guidance, and I'll give you lots of quotes, and the books I've mentioned that you can download have got lots of quotes from the statutory guidance, then a local authority's really got to, to follow that. It's not quite law, it's not been made by parliament, but it's, it's almost law. Uh, and it's got annexes, so if you want to know about charging rules, you go there. If you want to know about hospital discharge rules, you go there. It's all in detail. So um, definitions, I don't think we need to spend much time on that. Under the old legislation, the National Assistance Act talked about crippled people, handicapped people, um, by congenital deformity. Of course, that language, 1948, is no longer acceptable. The new Act talks about adults in need. Um, as we'll see, they must be in need because they have a physical or mental impairment or illness. Um, and really, that doesn't change much. It's just more politically correct. Carers is a very big change under the new legislation, although it's not that new. Um, under the old legislation, carers had to be providing regular and substantial care. The new act, uh, the relatively new act, says all they've got to be doing is providing care. It doesn't have to be regular, doesn't have to be substantial. Any care makes you a carer. And what is care? We'll look at that as the day goes on. Really interesting issue. Is it practical? Is it physical? No, the act is quite clear. It could be emotional. Much of the most damaging, hard caring is is emotional, keeping people on an even keel. Um, uh, <clears throat> the new uh, fad with social welfare legislation is the first section of an act must be principles. Uh, the, key, the Children Act has got principles, delays bad for children. If you can, you shouldn't make any orders about children. Um, if you can, children should be brought up within their own families. The Medical Capacity Act's got principles, the presumption of capacity, the fact that if you make an unwise decision, it doesn't mean you lack capacity necessarily. Uh, so they thought the CARE Act should kick off with principles. Um, so I thought, you know, I remember writing a lot about this, saying, well, yeah, let's have some good principles like independent living. The presumption is that disabled people should live independently, not be institutionalised. The presumption that support should be dignified. Um, the support shouldn't subject them to indignity. Uh, they should have choice. Uh, the government didn't really quite like that. Uh, so they said, no, the, the, the principle is well-being. Um, and so I used to sort of say, there's no principles. You know, well-being is such a fuzzy, meaningless idea. Uh, it's not a principle at all. But on most things, I'm wrong. And I was wrong on that, too. Uh, 
So I only have a sort of stippled line through it now. <clears throat> well, brain has proved to be very important, and so we're going to spend a bit of time on looking at how the courts, and particularly the ombudsman, have, have, have breathed life into it. The, the trouble with the Act is that it, it, was a, it defined well-being in incredibly broad terms. Um, so you've probably got that on your handout, but that slide sort of says, well, well, it doesn't even tell you what well-being is, it says it relates to. Uh, the Welsh legislation at least says well-being is. This one says it sort of relates to this, but that's just about every aspect of life. Uh, And then it goes on to say, there's another nine characteristics on the next slide. But I think here, uh, what we've come to discover is that, in fact, these are important. Because the presumption is the disabled person, the carer, is best placed to decide what is in their own well-being. And if you look at D and E, I think they're the ones, yeah, I do, those are actually pretty important. <coughs> uh, control over day-to-day -day life. I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm still a sort of dabbling solicitor uh, with, a, with, a, with a large practice. And we had a, a, a number of run-ins with local authorities who were putting very, very big restrictions on direct payments, on what you could use your direct payments for. Some of them were saying you had to have a thing called a direct payments card. Uh, and what we were saying is, well, the law doesn't say you can't put direct uh, conditions on how direct payments are made, but it doesn't say you can, <laughs> although direct payments must be used to meet the assessed need. Um, what you're doing is taking away all the choice and control we have. Um, and it's a fundamental principle of the Act that we have control over these things. Uh, and all those local authorities back down. Um, in, in that situation. The reason I think participation in work, education, training and recreation is really important is because of course these principles apply not only to disabled people but to carers. So carers have no law, legal duty to care and the Act is quite explicit. There must be no assumption that carers are willing or able to provide or continue to provide care. That's in the Act. But also it says the presumption is that carers should be able to stay in work, education, training, and go to aerobics in the evening if they want to, or in my case, the pub. Um, so um, this, is, this is an expectation, so carers should work if they want to work. Well, two and a half million carers give up work every year to care, and 80% of them don't want to do that. Um, so if an assessment says, she wants to remain in work, the local authority would have to meet the disabled person's needs to enable that person to stay in work. So these are very important presumptions. Um, it then has another, as I say, nine principles uh, that we should have regard to. And I've already flagged up the importance of the first one, which we'll come back to, is that the individual the care of the disabled person is best place to make these decisions. And if you're going to say you don't agree, then you give us some evidence, because otherwise the default position is the disabled person, the carer, is the position that has to be respected. <clears throat> Adults um, are in need, disabled people, elderly people, people with mental health problems, people with substance misuse problems, all people in need. Um, substance misuse is, is sort of very often neglected, but substance misuse, um, the, the Act says that your need must arise out of a physical and mental impairment or illness, and substance misuse is considered an addiction, and, and addiction is considered an illness. So um, all of those people have rights, and all the people that care for them have rights. And when they are being assessed, you must involve the carer. Not if they ask or they don't ask, you must involve the carer. Under the old law, there was no duty to involve the carer. Now there's just a duty. It's not 
uh, restricted in any way. You must involve the carer when you're involving uh, assessing a disabled person. And when you assess a disabled person, they're what we call court carer blind. You ignore any input from the carer. You will you'll note it down, uh, because that will be useful when you do the carer's assessment, but you, you ignore any input. So if I were, say, caring for my disabled son, who's, say, 25, um, and um, has profound learning disabilities and therefore needs 24-7 care, and I'm providing 24-7 care, then the assessment of the disabled young person um, would be that he needs help getting up in the morning, help in the bathroom, help dressing, help washing, help feeding, watching. So he needs 24-7 care. Uh, you then turn to the care and say, well, he needs 24-7 care. Um, are you willing and able to provide any of that care? Because you don't have to. If they're, over an, if they're an adult, I think it would be the same as a child. And the, and the carer will say, well, yeah, I'm happy to do it those days or those hours. And so the diary fills in carer, carer, carer. But the rest of the diary, the blanks, have to be filled in by the statutory agencies because the carer doesn't have to do it. And the assessment should ignore input from the carer. The carer is useful for, for informing what the person needs, but it's not saying, well, look, where are the problems? Are you're doing all of this. So you have a problem on Thursday afternoon. You, don't, you, you basically start with a blank diary, work out that the disabled person needs help at all of those hours, and then you say to the carer, can you help with any of these hours? But you don't have to. That's legally the situation. The eligibility criteria, which... Um, uh, we're going to look about look here a slightly different from the old well they're very different from the old criteria the pre 2015 criteria you have criteria for adults in need disabled people um, so you're assessed and then you have to work out whether that need that you're talking about is eligible and, and largely we'll look at these in some detail but they're largely about you not being able to do certain things wash yourself help yourself, feed yourself, access the community, things like that. And you're only eligible if you, there's two, there's a list of nine things and you've got to, to be eligible, you've got to be in, incapable, of, unable to do two of them. Uh, and if you're eligible, then the local authority must meet that need. They must put in support to meet that eligible need to help with cooking or um, accessing the community or accessing the bathroom or what have you. They must meet that need. But if you are not eligible, then they don't have to provide anything. Even though you've got needs, they're saying they're not eligible because there's only one need or what have you. And that used to be the end of it because uh, the, there were only eligibility criteria for adults in need. But now there's eligibility criteria for carers. So the adult in need has been told that they're not going to get any support. And they say, well, I don't like that, but um, I want you to assess my wife because she's caring for me. And there's the, exactly the same duty to assess disabled people and carers. Carers have exactly the same rights to support as disabled people. So even though the adult is ineligible, you still have to assess the carer. Now the carer's criteria <clears throat> are incredibly generous. When we look at them, you'll see that it's very difficult to conceive of many carers not being eligible. The adult criteria quite, are not so generous, but the carer's criteria are very generous. So the carer is assessed and they're eligible. And you then say to the carer, well, what would you like in order to meet your need? Well, I want to stay in work, um, or I want to go back to college and do a part-time PhD in the carer's movement. Uh, so what do you need? Well, whilst I'm there, I need somebody to sit with my husband, who's not eligible. 
Most carer support is pro providing a service to the person for whom they care, a sitting service of some form. 80-90% of carer support is provided to the person for whom they care. And what the Act says is that if a carer is eligible, then subject to certain capital financial rules, you must provide support for them, including if it means providing support for the person for whom they care, who is ineligible. That's a huge change. That's an enormous change. Um, so often carers used to say, well, what's the point of being assessed? And the answer is, in the old days, you'd say, well, I'm not really sure. Uh, um, I mean, I could have explained it, but, but the reality is that even if they found a carer had a need, they didn't have to meet it. It was only discretion. Now there's a duty. And now the Act is quite clear that you can meet a carer's needs by providing support to the disabled person who themselves are ineligible. So the carer's going to need an assessment because it could make up any shortfall in the support for the person for whom they care. You probably need to be drinking to get the rest of that, but it's quite an interesting, radical change that's produced no litigation at all. Is that all right so far? You're all terribly silent. Michelle? Uh, this guy, you have to wait. Jan is arriving. Oh, sorry. I don't like this. I don't like talking to them anyway. So you probably, yep, there we are, not too close. Um, so Luke, I was just going to ask you, there, there, there seems to be a lack of what support actually does um, interpret into for a carer, and it's sort of become this sort of bit of a, you give them a little bit of money, a personal yeah. um, budget, and they can go and do whatever they like. And it's, it's quite, um, it, it, it's controversial. I've always been yeah. panning on this one for a while, but, it, doesn't necessarily constitute support to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can provide support two ways. You can either provide support by providing a sitting service or some arrangement for the disabled person, which then allows the carer to stay in work or to go down to the horse racing or whatever they want to do. Um, so you could, So most support for carers is by delivering a service to the disabled person so that it gives the carer a break. It's, it's called replacement care now, really. But you can also give carers a service themselves, and we'll look at that. Uh, and historically, that has been stuff like a little budget to go and have a meal or get your hair done or something like that, which I've been incredibly critical about, which I think are tokenistic, I'll, sort of opiate type services. The problem is that they're incredibly popular. Carers, the research suggests they value them. And so for a small personal budget, small tokenistic budget, carers, um, I mean, you see, the, I mean, look, authorities are cutting these tokenistic sort of small personal budgets, but they produce disproportionate feeling of well-being. Um, it's another really interesting part-time PhD for another of you. I mean, because, of course, services have not only a practical impact, they have a, um, they have a psychological impact. Uh, t uh, um, so, I mean, we run the whole British country on this, don't we? If you behave yourself, and now we're told if you don't try and do tax avoidance, and you do that for 50 years, then we will, at the end of that, give you a bit of tin, which is called a CBE or an OBE or something like that. And no disrespect to all of you that have those wonderful bits of tin, but it's pretty cheap. Uh, 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 and people love that. It's, it's an incredibly tokenistic, but it, it is invested with a huge amount of a sense of, how, you know, community has acknowledged my worth. And so giving, Care is a small tokenistic something. Unfortunately, is quite a 
the research suggests it's a very well received thing. But in general, carers are not in that business. They're, I mean, they should be throwing themselves under the Queen's horse, as far as I'm concerned, but they don't want to do that for some strange reason. So um, they should be asking for uh, you know, practical support largely for the person for whom they care. But there are many carers who, who you can't separate. So sometimes a carer will say, um, I need a break. I, need, I just need a break. I, I haven't been on holiday for 16 years or whatever, which is a case I had not long ago. And the answer is, you can't have a break without taking the disabled person with you. And they're saying, well, that's fine. Uh, you know, if we could both go away on holiday together. Well, the disabled person could have that paid straightforwardly, and so could the carer. You know, you could, pay the, you could give them a personal budget for them to go on holiday. It might be a very form, cheap form of respite care, and there's, there's cases on this. So giving carers personal budgets can be useful. It's just when they become a standardised, oh, well, we give you £90 a year for that then that's wrong because you've got to meet carers' needs, you've got to quantify carers' needs and you've got to give them what they need. Could I, the, you were saying that about so many people wanting these payments and the, the short answer is that a lot of people, especially in this area of the country, do not have enough really once we retire to be able to live properly. I, I did say to David Cameron, because he was my MP at one time before he retired, um, that when I was younger there was sort of London waiting in various jobs or, or, or different sort of things, whereby in different areas of the country you got a little more or a little extra. And I said the trouble with the pension is that wherever you live in the country, you, you know, it, it's, it's tough around here, you get the same, it, my husband comes from Lincolnshire, and there we could manage, okay, um, but not down here. And his attitude was, well, what he said to me was, we'll move then. Now, I, I'm, I only mention that because that's our caring politicians, and I thought, you know, it's a very okay. interesting okay. thing that people yeah. have money. But the, what I wanted to say is that it matters an awful lot. Now, my <coughs> husband's in a home now, so it, the situation yeah. is different. But the money that I had... You know, a did put towards, yeah, yeah. and I don't think that they would af they would afford enough for a, a holiday for both. It is very and it's all being cut back. Yeah. But that's why people want it. It's because they need more money. Mm -hmm. I don't know what. what okay. We well, well, I will just move on from that. All I can just say is that this part-time PhD is clearly yours, uh, uh, because I think it's more complex. Uh, that, that services have a practical component, but they, they also have a, a status component. Uh, um, uh, and you, obviously having money, if you're short of money, is, is a practical thing. Well, that's if you've important. got money, yeah. you can have somebody live in with you. Yeah, no yeah, yeah. Okay, any more? This, ah, uh, yeah, they, two more. One, um, two, yeah. Oh. Church has a statutory payment of about £300. Yeah. They automatically give you if you fill in forms. Is that legal? Yeah, if people want to give money away, it's perfectly legal. Um, well, there's nothing to stop. Uh, local authorities got a huge amount of powers to give you money. Um, uh, the Localism Act uh, allows them to just give you money. Uh, the Section 111 of the Local Government Act 1972 allows them to give you money. Uh, most local authorities, I mean, not in the privileged position of Oxford of having surplus dosh to, <laughs> to, to, to scatter around. It's not unusual for a number of, I mean, it, it's becoming less common. But I mean, I don't think a local authority would just give you 300 quid a week a month, a year, yeah. for being a carer. Normally they would say, well, you've got to be getting carer's allowance or something like that or something like that. I mean, there will be some criteria because there's six and a half million carers in the UK. And oh, yeah, you fill in the form. Yeah, you fill in the form. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it, it, it seems to me uh, there's sort of equality issues about that. Uh, but if... It, 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 
I, I wouldn't want to go to court over a case like that. Um, it, you could pick holes in it in very, you know, they'd have to have done an equality impact assessment, they'd have done those. But if they want to give carers some money, they can. And historically they used to, because they were used to be in uh, 1996, a carer special grant. So local authorities were given money by central government to, and 10% and of it had to be spent on things like this. So that you got this, the emergence of these, what I think is slightly tokenistic, payments in London, they'll pay for any carer to join the gym or something, you know. It's, it's untargeted, but there's, I mean, it could be a joint PhD if, if, you, if you want, uh, because it seems much more complicated now I think about it. Uh, is that all right? So. I just want to ask about court of protection. Presumably that works as a carer blind where I've got deputy ship for my son. So I have to speak on his behalf because he has no verbal communication skills. Um, so I have to sort of be him for the assessment of him and then me for the assessment of him. Is that right? No. I mean, is it a financial one? It's both, it's both is it? Gosh. Um, so you can have, I mean, we're not going to look at quarter protection um, uh, substituted decision making today. But we will deal with this briefly. If you are 16 or over and you lack capacity to make decisions, um, then in general the local authority has to make what's, a best, what's called a best interest decision. If you're um, over 18, you can get a deputy ship from the Court of Protection. Uh, and that says that you can make financial decisions, but in your case, you, you have two, two, two deputy ships. One's called a lasting, um, is a property and affairs deputy ship. Um, but deputy ships can also be given enhanced powers to make social welfare decisions about where you live, whether you're assessed, whether you have medical treatment and so on. Um, and courts are very reluctant to give deputies that power, very reluctant indeed, but obviously in your case they have given you that power. So if you are a deputy for a disabled person and you have social welfare powers, personal welfare powers, then you basically will be making those decisions if the local authority is satisfied that the person lacks capacity, because you can have capacity to do one thing and not the other. You could have capacity to agree to penicillin but not to an open heart surgery. You know, it's, it's, it's relative. There's, there's just two issues there, that the local authority must always involve the disabled person. So regardless of the fact that you have a deputy ship, they must involve the disabled person. And deputies must always act in the best interests of somebody. And if the local authority disagrees with that, then effectively they'd have to go to the court of protection. Um, but, but ultimately, once you've got um, one of those deputy ship powers, you're in a very strong position. One of the things I should say um, in the toolkit that I showed you that showed these different things, and I said, you know, use snippets of law, um, use the word maladministration. There's a very interesting, and, and, and I, I've just been talking about this tokenism, but this sort of status of tokenistic services. Most people who have a disabled young adult that they're caring for don't need a deputy ship you have, under the Mental Capacity Act, the power to make decisions. But having a form with a court stamp on it that says you're the deputy changes the space between you and public sector. Suddenly they accord you status, which they should accord you anyway. And we call that credentialism. Um, and it's a very useful technique if you've got a challenge. If you say to the local authority, I need this, and they say no, they will often ignore you. So I, I run our research unit, we get our students to do a lot of advice for families. A family will write in saying, look, we've written to the local authority asking for transport to school. And we've, we've told them that this is the route and our uh, child just can't possibly get there without support, um, even though it's only two miles or three miles away from us, it's just would be too bad because of their condition. And the local authority just write back and say, get lost. We then put exactly what they've done 
we exactly word for word on a Leeds University letterhead and suddenly the local authority give in. So if you can get somebody, David Cameron as an MP or, or your headmaster on Hogwarts letterhead or, or St Trinian's or whatever, if you could just put it on a letterhead and say exactly what you've said, suddenly it changes. And that's what's interesting about the court of protection stuff. You don't really need a deputyship. In, 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 in theory, lawyers would say, well, why have you got one? And the answer is, because it changes your status immediately when you're dealing with the public body. They shouldn't, but they do. Sorry. So, at the moment, I've got court of protection with myself. I really don't want to get into this. We'll, we'll do one more, but I'm not going to get sucked down the mental capacity black hole. I've got court hole. of protection with my son for my disabled daughter, which is only finance. Is it worth me fighting and going back to get welfare, or is it something that I don't need to fight over? Generally, the court is very reluctant indeed to give welfare powers to a deputy. You'd have to have some very clear evidence as to why it was needed. That said, sometimes they slip through. I personally don't think... I mean, I think you've got a form with a stamp on it that says deputy. I think that's good enough in credentialism terms. The fact that it's a financial one, not a personal welfare one. Um, I, I think the court, of, the court once, once the issue has arisen, the court of protection is very reluctant to give personal welfare powers in relation to disabled young people. Um, it's much more, I mean, nearly all personal welfare attorneys are given to people in their 80s uh, when in relation to the donors are in their 80s or 90s. So getting personal welfare powers for a younger person is quite unusual. I mean, there are tens of thousands of financial attorneys every year. There's, there's probably one or 200 personal welfare ones for younger people. So I wouldn't necessarily do it. But I know there are lots of, when I'm talking about disabled, when I'm talking to parents of disabled children, young people, adults, there are a lot of people that said, well, I've got one and it's made a big difference. And that's to do with the credentialism. So um, I think the court is generally reluctant to do it. So you might just be spending quite a lot of money and, and having it rejected. But it, legally, it doesn't really make a bit of difference. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, you've got 10 more minutes. Right. Um, so what we need to now do is to say, how do you establish that an adult with a mental or physical impairment or illness um, has a need that is to be met by the local authority? The answer is you look at this stuff called the eligibility criteria. These are laid down in law now, in regulations made by parliament. Under the old law, a local authority could say, well, that's not a need, that's a want, that's a wish, whatever. Under the new law, they can't do that because the parliament has said what needs are. Um, and it's basically in these regulations say that you've got to have, there's a list of nine needs, and if you've got two of those you can't do, then you're eligible for support, providing you've got a low income, uh, capital below 23,250, and provided you live in the area of the local authority that you're trying to challenge. So you've got to have a need caused by a physical or mental impairment or an illness. It's got to, as a result of that physical or mental impairment, you can't do two or more things. And as a consequence, you can't, it will have an impact on your well-being. Well, what we've seen is well-being is hugely widely defined anyway. So it's two or more. It's got to be significant, but of course I'm the best person to judge you sig what's significant. So significant doesn't seem to have been a significant word. And there we've got the nine, I think it's nine, criteria. Because I'm a disabled person, I can't manage and maintain my nutrition. I can't maintain personal hygiene. I can't manage my toilet needs. I can't be appropriately clothed, and so on. Now, 
what happens is, um, and we'll come on to that, is that what does managing your nutrition mean? Well, that's where the statutory guidance fleshes that out and gives us a definitive statement. So that's what it's important for us to understand. But before we go there, we need to say, well, in order to be eligible, I can't do two of those things. What does can't do mean? Um, and the Act says you can't do it if you need help to do it, because this is a thing you've got to do on your, your own. And we ignore any support. So you, you can't do it if you can't do it yourself. Or you could do it, but it would cause you pain, distress, or anxiety. So anxiety is, is quite different to being in pain. You can't do it if it would cause a health and safety risk to yourself or others, or it would take significantly longer than normal. So those are, there's quite an expansive meaning to can't do. So the first one is you can't manage and maintain your nutrition. Does that mean you could die, you have to be dying of starvation? You have to be showing sort of symptoms of malnutrition? And the, 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 the code of practice, which has really got the force of law, says, no, no, that's not what we mean. Uh, it means whether the adult has access to food and drink, yes, and that they're able to prepare and consume the food and drink. That word prepare is an expensive word for the UK. Um, under the old law, local authority would say, look, you need to be fed. We're going to arrange for pre-cooked frozen meals to be delivered to you every week and we're going to give you a microwave. You want to cook, you want to shop, but I'm sorry, we don't think that's a need, that's a wish, that's a choice. We only give you this. Under the new law, you've got to be able to help the person prepare and can prepare food if they are able and wish that's what they want to do. And there's some more guidance that goes with this issued by the um, National Institute for Clinical Excellence that says that that should include shopping. Uh, well, that's quite a big change. I really like one of you. None of you so far have been very interested in this, to do a part-time PhD <laughs> <coughs> on the social meal, food and social care. Social care started at the end of the Second World War because the WRVS, the Women's Voluntary Service, it became the Women's Royal Voluntary Service, started doing Meals on Wheels. What is, a, what, is a, what is food? Is it just nutrition or is it social? We have an endemic of loneliness. Isn't food a communal activity? Um, the history of food and uh, the history of the sort of social meal, deconstructing the social meal, would be a fab PhD. I can see you're all tempted. Um, so we have a case. You have a blind person, and she needed help, among other things, to check the contents of her fridge, read cooking instructions, and have an escort to help her on occasional shopping trips. That's what she says she needed. And the local authority said, um, well, yes, this does relate to eating and meals, um, but we don't think this is significant because she could eat, she could use long life foods. She could use a freezer and ready meals. Now, if you're trying to challenge that sort of kickback from a local authority, you've basically got to say, is this having an impact on her well-being? <coughs> so you then go to look at well-being, and there are the two lists. And what you've got to say is that that response, that you can just have pre-cooked, uh, ready-made meals, you don't need fresh food, you don't need um, to be able to cook and prepare food, it won't be significant. Which of those well-being criteria does it offend? Now, often it will offend many, but any suggestions? Social. Another one? Pun? Wishes and feelings, yes. That's pretty strong. 
Control to date life, yeah. All of them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the officer doesn't agree with that. I mean, the officer, the officer basically puts on a blindfold and just pokes at one. Um, I find it a really useful thing that she did in the sense that she said that's physical health, which is pretty obvious. Why should disabled people and poor people only be expected to have rubbish food? Uh, so she said, uh, maladministration, that lovely word, for a large authority to fail to recognise that fresh food is essential to meet nutritional needs and the consumption of fresh food once it's started to perish carries significant health risk. So she's just saying it's a health issue. You're supposed to eat fresh food, um, even if you're a disabled person. Um, it's sort of rather refreshing, really. Um, somebody told me that once you've opened Long Life Milk, it goes off. Of course, I never knew that, but it seemed to be almost an irrational statement anyway. So, um, so the, the, the second one, we, uh, I'll break in a couple of minutes. Um, but I'm giving you a flavour of the way you challenge decisions. It's the same case, actually. She's also, um, she was saying, well, because I'm blind, I need to have this. But she also said that she needed to have help dressing so that she, was she would be appropriately dressed, for instance, in relation to the weather. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. This is what the um, regulations say. You've got to be able to be appropriately clothed. This is then provided with more detail in the statutory guidance that says that the adults, the, the local authority should consider the adults' ability to dress themselves and be appropriately dressed, appropriately dressed, for instance, in relation to weather and to maintain their health. So in her case, she said she needed help to sort clothes so she didn't wear stained or inappropriate clothing. She couldn't see it. The council said, well, yeah, this is dressing, but it's not a dressing outcome that will have sufficiently significant to be eligible because you're, it's not as if you, you know, you'll know if it's cold, you'll wear a thick coat. If it's not, if it's warm, you won't wear a coat. This is just sort of trifling stuff. Um, whether you're wearing stained or inappropriate clothing, we don't think that that's significant. So you go back to the eligibility criteria, the well-being criteria, and I think we'd all agree, at least on this one. It's, it's dignity, isn't it? You know, um, dignity is quite a complicated word, but indignity is quite a simple word. This is just not, you know, how, if you don't know whether you're wearing stained clothes or not, even if you're not wearing stained clothes, it's, you still don't know, do you? So, and the ombudsman said it's dignity. Maladministration for a local authority to fail to recognise the importance of an adult's personal dignity in wearing clean, presentable, appropriate clothes. So that's basically, you're saying, I need this. It's, it's one of that list of nine things. And then the local authority said, well, you may need it, but it's not significant. And then you go back and say, well, actually, eating fresh food or you know, knowing that you're not wearing inappropriate clothes. Um, at Leeds, I work um, the law school. The centre I work for is run by one of the most inspirational people I know, somebody called Anna Lawson, who's blind. She's the first blind professor of law. She went for an interview at the House of Lords the other day and wore mismatched socks. She didn't get the job. Uh, she's convinced that it was. Um, so I went for a job there as well, wearing identical matching socks. And I didn't get it either. So. <laughs> She was wearing trousers. Um, I think we'll break. <laughs>